I'm going to talk about Messier 38, um, which is an open cluster, uh, like all the open clusters in the Milky Way. It's in the plane of the Milky Way, so it's actually in the plane of our galaxy in the constellation of Auriga. It's quite an exciting constellation. It's sufficiently exciting that it made it into the astronomy picture of the day a year or so back. So the constellation of Auriga is in the plane of the Milky Way, but it's kind of in the opposite direction to the centre of the galaxy, so it's kind of looking out through our galaxy. This is kind of a wide field view of part of Auriga, and you can see there's a whole lot going on here. There's a supernova remnant, so a star blew up over here. And there's a, a star cluster that's in the process of forming here. But here's our cluster M38 here. And in addition to M38, I also want to talk about its little companion down here, which is a little hard to see in this picture. That's NGC 1907. And so there was quite a lot of interest over a number of years about whether these were a twin pair of clusters, whether they were a pair of clusters that were formed together, or whether they really were just two things that just happened to lie in the same part of the sky. One of the other things about, interesting things about Messier 38 is actually it's one of the objects that Messier didn't find himself. It was actually found 100 years before Messier was doing his thing by a guy called Hodierna. I was reading about this the other day and it was referred to as a silent discovery, which I think means that he found it, wrote it down somewhere, and then it was lost for hundreds of years. I think it was only in the 1980s that it was realised that Hodierna had actually discovered a whole bunch of the objects that Messier then went on to discover as well. And he did the interesting thing, he was the first person who tried to actually classify these fuzzy objects he was finding into things that you could immediately see were stars when you just looked at them with the naked eye, things that you could tell that were stars when you pointed a telescope at them, and things which, even when you pointed a telescope at them, you couldn't tell were stars. And so this particular uh, cluster is in that intermediate category of things which, if you just look at them with the naked eye, they just look faint and fuzzy, but if you point a telescope at them, even the very crude telescope he had in the 17th century, you could see that it was made up of a whole bunch of stars. Okay, so I guess we should get back to the story of this little friend it's got. This is the same bit of the sky we were looking at before, kind of zoomed in on the cluster, and it's contour mapped to really pick out where the stars are. So this is a, just a single bright star relatively nearby. Here's Messier 38, and here's its little companion down here, NGC 1907. So there really is a collection of stars here, and as I say, there was this interesting question of whether star clusters form in pairs, and so this is a sort of twin birth of star clusters, or whether they're just two things that happen to be in the same part of the sky. There's a number of things you can do to try and figure out whether they're twins or not. One thing you can do is try and see if they're the same age. It turns out they're not. Second thing you can do is you can measure their distances, and we've done various things about how you measure the distances to clusters. Um, and it turns out, until recently, their distances were kind of compatible with each other. Again, it looked like one was a bit further away than the other, but the distances weren't that accurately measured, um, so it was hard to tell. And then the final thing you can do is measure how fast the clusters are moving, because obviously if they're moving in completely different directions at high speed, then they're probably nothing at all to do with each other. And that's the bit that this paper from early in this century, so from 2002, set out to do was to look at whether the two clusters were actually physically associated with each other by measuring their motions. The trick you can play is once you can see how fast things are moving, you can kind of wind the clock back and see where they came from. And it looks like they came from completely different parts of the sky. So it looks like they really aren't twins. So the last interesting question you can then ask is, OK, so maybe they weren't sort of birth twins, but maybe they're adoptive twins. Maybe they're actually now merging together. They'll actually end up sort of in orbit around one another. The last neat part of the, the calculation um, that these guys did when they were looking at the motions of these things was to look at the, the future evolution of them and look at actually how they're moving now. They did some very detailed simulations of star clusters and whether they've merged together. And so this picture here, for example, this is their simulation of a bunch of stars trying to reproduce it. In this particular simulation, the two aren't merging. They're actually moving at very high speeds relative to one another and they'll just whiz past one another. But again, there's a range of uncertainty here. So they cranked all the uncertainties as far as they could in the direction of making the two things merge with one another. And they found that actually you could almost get it to work, but with one interesting flaw, which is if you've got two things that are sort of in the process of merging, it means they're moving quite slowly relative to one another if they're going to be, end up captured together. Um, and what happens when things are moving very slowly relative to one another is that the tidal forces between them, so the pull of gravity, but it's really the difference in the pull of gravity on the back of the thing and the front of the thing, starts to stretch it out. And so what will happen in this case, as these two things come and, and will end up bound to each other, is you end up with a thing called a bridge. You end up pulling the stars from this one this way and pulling the stars from this one this way, and you actually end up with a kind of a line of stars between them. And so they did some simulations. It's a little hard to see from the number of points you had here, but you can see again, here's a contour plot of their two star clusters. In this case, it's one of these ones where they're going to become bound to each other. And you can see there's this weird little feature in between. And that's this bridge of stars that you will end up getting between these if they're in the process of merging. If you look, go back to our picture of the, the two star clusters, 
there was absolutely no evidence of anything in between them at all. And so this, in 2002, was really finally able to rule out the possibility that these things were actually in the process of merging. Now what's happened subsequent to that is that the Gaia satellite has been up there measuring the distances to stars extremely accurately, including the distances to stars in this pair of clusters. And it turns out that with these much more accurate measurements, the distance between them, kind of along the line of sight, is more than a thousand light years. So actually they're not really physically associated with one another at all. So if they just you know hung around for another 20 years, they could have answered the question. But the What's elegant about this is that, that even without being able to measure those things very accurately, they were able to use the kind of the physics of what was going on to really say, actually, these things really can't be in the process of, of merging or at least becoming on that bound orbit, because if they were, we'd have seen this sort of tidal feature between them. We don't see it, and therefore we can infer that they're not merging. So there you go, Messier yeah. 38. Not the most exciting cluster in the world, but at least there's something to say about it. It has to be tied to a very accurate reference frame because you, you, you can't, you know, everything, everything is moving a little bit. The lesson that comes away from this, I guess, is that star formation is a really messy process. 